Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Melissa Sheehan, and I'm on the marketing team here at Vendini. Today, we will be chatting about strategies for improving online engagement and conversions. So in a few minutes here, I will be turning it over to your presenter. Um, one thing to mention is that Keith Goldberg, our original presenter, is unfortunately unable to be with us today. So um, John Youth, our product manager here at Vendini, is going to be stepping up as your presenter for today. But don't worry, you're in great hands, so I will turn it over to John in a moment. Um, a couple housekeeping items before we get started. Um, the attendee, your attendee audio has been muted to cut down on background noise, but we really want today's webinar to be interactive. So we've incorporated a couple polls into the webinar. You also have the ability to raise your hand um, to respond to questions that John will ask you throughout the webinar. And um, you'll also see a question panel in your attendee chat panel. So please make sure that you are um, asking questions as they come up through the webinar and John will pause and um, field them throughout and I'll help him field them as a moderator. Um, if you're having any uh, challenges with your audio, I will send a link in the attendee chat window so that you can um, troubleshoot if needed. And so now I will uh, turn it over to John Youth. John, take it away. Hi, good morning everyone. So um, as Melissa said, uh, today we're talking about a uh, winning strategy for online engagement and conversions. My name is John Utes. I'm the product manager here at Vendini. Uh, we have... So um, my background is a long background of arts and technology. Uh, I got an engineering degree from the University of Texas. I worked in semiconductors for quite a while. Um, most more recently, I've also been working for uh, some um, nonprofit and actually worked for three or four years in a nonprofit arts uh, SMU and ballet here in San Francisco. So I, I have quite a bit of um, information and background um, that combines both arts and um, performing arts and uh, a lot with the technology. So here at Vendini, and uh, just so you know, this is not a, meant to be a uh, sales pitch today. We're just here, this is my um, obligation to the company to show a few slides about our company. But uh, here at Vendini, um, we make the life, um, the business of live events simple. We have, a, we're all in one system, comprised of ticketing, um, event logistics, fundraising, patron management, marketing, and uh, we can actually also host your website. So it's an all-in-one system that can bring uh, a more of an enterprise level that brings all of your things under one roof. With Vendini, uh, we have a few, uh, quite a few major um, organizations that are members of ours, and this is just a few of them in there, uh, that you might recognize uh, right off the bat here on this slide. So question, where are we today? And this is more related to what's, what's in the marketplace today. And today we are in the midst of a boom. And this is an, an explosion, uh, explosion in the mobile market. Uh, there's been uh, heaps of mobile devices that are available to us from phones to tablets to laptops, wearables. Uh, and because of all of this access, uh, all of these mobile devices, it really affects the way that we communicate and how we access and share information. Just a quick question for everyone. Um, have, have, have you viewed an, e an email on your phone or been frustrated with a poor viewing experience? So we're going to take a quick poll and see how many people have, have been frustrated with a poor mobile experience or poor email experience. seconds for everyone to chime in here. Okay, so it looks like looks like 83% of people said that they have viewed an email on their phone and been frustrated with the, the viewing experience. This goes right along with the data that we have here that one in four searches today are conducted via mobile phone. Um, there's thousands of hours being spent um, on mobile devices. 57% of people 
wouldn't recommend companies with four mobile sites. Um, SMS coupons are redeemed more often, eight times more often than email offers. And 59% of mobile searches um, uh, or mobile search ads are found to be useful. So uh, it's really a, a staggering amount of time that's being um, spent on mobile devices, and you really can't uh, ignore it, or you know, you have to stay up with the technology and be present with the mobile the mobile trends. And this really brings us to the, the point that access for information is really 24/7, and the internet has changed has brought that about. Mobile mobile has changed the way that information is available via the web, and mobile devices make a wealth of information available on the internet and easily accessible around the clock whenever the urge strikes someone. So really, you know, this brings us to the next topic: it's the age of now. Um, it's the expectation. Um, whenever the urge strikes someone. Um, they are going to go through it. They're going to go to your website or look at your website to try to find information about you, um, which this is a lot of good things for you because it can lessen the burden on your staff. Um, it can uh, uh, you, you no longer have to have um, uh, people available to answer questions um, at all hours, um, and people can really um, but. On, the, on that topic, you also need to have a well thought out web space, um, mobile presence, and a social presence for these people to go and access this information whenever they want to. So we have um, the next part is about um, engaging your audience and who is really using this mobile experience. And the first group of people is, is your millennials. And what are really millennials and what we are discussing here today? Uh, millennials are Generation Y. They're, they were born in the 80s and 90s. They're in their teens to mid-30s. Uh, and they're really a future audience for most of uh, performing arts organizations. And what makes millennials different? Um, so millennials are different uh, and age and income aside is really their exposure to technology. Uh, most of the uh, millennials have only known technology and get a variety in most of their information via technology. So millennials are always connected. They're very social by nature. They love to network. They're very vocal. Um, and they share their opinions. Uh, they seek participatory experiences. So they don't really want to be passive, um, uh, passively attend events. They want to experience them and share them. Um, and feel like they're part of an organization. Uh, considering, um, so for one of the examples of a participatory experience, you might want to have, uh, to engage millennials, you might want to have a, a young adults night. But remember, when you engage this audience, you want to make sure that they feel welcome and that they're part of, the uh, part of your organization. So you, things to consider when you have this type of event is you might want to, um, Change, exact, uh, change the type of people that you have working in or that they interface with when they come to your uh, event. You might want to look and see who's working in your box office, who's greeting them at the door, who's taking their tickets, um, the ushers. These are all different things that you're going to want to consider and to make sure that the, the people, the audience for your, that evening or that event, you're really speaking to them and not, not necessarily to your traditional audience. Uh, another thing about millennials is that they very um, they highly value reviews and recommendations. Uh, these are uh, recommendations not only from their friends and family, but more uh, more so from their uh, um, more so from just uh, general public opinion, such as Yelp. Reviews are very uh, important to them, and uh, recommendations of that uh, social recommendations are uh, very important. And so who are your patrons today, aside from millennials? Your patrons today, and this is just speaking to the general group, your patrons today are very connected. And not only are they connected via your website, but also they're very connected socially. So there's Facebook, there's Twitter, uh, Pinterest. There's many, many different ways that they can get information about your organization or your event. They're very informed. 
they do a lot of research before they, they even get to your door. They trust, um, they trust their network for recommendations and highly value recommendations endorsed com by complete strangers. And this goes back to um, people listening to Yelp reviews or are, are getting recommendations from that, from those different types of um, uh, uh, social media platforms. Uh, your uh, patrons are very empowered. They can make decisions. They can buy tickets on their own right from your website. And they can really engage uh, uh, with you and be empowered to know information about you because they can research about you, find information about you from just about anywhere. And it's important as arts marketers, it's our job really uh, to build a rapport with our patrons uh, via our website, social media, and marketing efforts uh, in order to build trust in them, to pique their interest, and really engage them to, to make them feel like they're a part of your organization. So the next topic is, is about fostering participatory experiences. I touched on this a little bit with, your, with millennials, but um, this is especially relevant uh, for the millennials, but it's also important for all of your audience. Uh, you want to make sure that you have a lot of uh, your, uh, that you want to engage your audience, not only while they're in your theater or sitting in their seat, but the entire time that they're at your venue. It's, they might spend more time or as much time at your venue um, if you have several different intermissions or they get there early, they stay a little bit after the performance, they're going to be spending a lot of time at your event, and you want to make sure that you're engaging them at all levels of the event. Uh, you know, lobby experiences are uh, extremely important. You can have maybe some special music groups there. You can have some photo opportunities for them. Uh, you might want to have uh, some kind of interactive board for them uh, to put up, um, uh, put up uh, quotes or notes to people. Uh, one example that I like to use is at the, the ballet that I used to work at. Uh, we had a, a graffiti wall, that's what we called it. It's just a large wall of paper. And on this wall, we had a lot of, uh, we had next to it, we had um, little sticky notes and pens. And our patrons could come up and write a note on a sticky note, and they could stick it on, the, uh, on this wall. The, we would take pictures of them, or we would take the notes down afterwards, and we could use them for our online marketing, or we would send them if they were specific to a dancer or somewhat something like that. We would take the, the picture or the note back there, and you know, people were very happy to, to see that they had fans out in the audience that wanted to write about them. It even sparked lively discussions about the content of the, what was going on on stage. So the audience really got engaged with the, the organization um, by, by doing this type of experience for them in the lobby. Some other, other participatory experiences are um, you could have flash mobs. Um, the Berkeley College of Music, they, they did a huge flash mob uh, in Boston uh, at the Fine Art Museum. It was very well received. Um, you can have interactive sing-alongs. Uh, they have these um, uh, in the San Francisco area. Uh, at the Castro Theater, that was something that's uh, become quite popular. Um, you can also have uh, patron-curated art, uh, drawing portraits of things that uh, relate to the subject matter or something that you might want to display as a slideshow in your lobby from patron-generated art. Uh, at this new and ballet, we also used, um, we had a participatory experience for children. So um, part of the Christmas ballet, Every year, we had slides at the beginning and uh, that went along with a poem. And we would, every year, invite children um, of our patrons to come. And we would take these, uh, we would read the poem to them or have the poem played to them and have the children uh, draw uh, sketches. And then we would incorporate those sketches into, actually into the performance as an introduction to the ballet. So just another way that you can have people uh, engage and participate and not just be a passive audience. So aside from being educated, and so our patrons today are very educated and empowered. 
Um, how many of you, uh, let's just see a show of hands, how many people here um, read online reviews before seeing a performance uh, using Amazon Consumer Report, maybe Rotten Tomatoes uh, before streaming a Netflix event, um, or even using Yelp before you go and visit a, uh, before going and visiting uh, a store. So yeah, I see quite a few of you also use uh, uh, use a lot of these cons these um, really uh, reviews based on strangers, and it's not just your trusted network. So it's really important today that your your brand that you have this information out there, and that you know you're aware of where people are seeking information. Also, so you want to monitor these. And make sure that you, if you see, if you see potentially negative reviews, or uh, that you reach out to the people that are uh, unhappy with their experience, and really engage with them and make them feel like you know that you were going to take care of them, and use it as a customer service and a way to build your brand and build your loyalty as well. So what are the trends shaping the market space today? So one of the trends that's really um, really shaping the marketplace today is something called the human brand. And this is the warmth and impact the warmth the impact of warmth and confidence on a brand loyalty. So this is a this slide is showing you a, the, the cover for a book by Chris Malone and Susan T. Fisk. Um, and it's really it's really about how to make your brand more, more compassionate and more warm, so that it's not just something static uh, that people can't relate to. And the more that you humanize your brand and make it something that people can interact with and feel comfortable with, the more they're going to feel they're going to trust and embrace your your brand or your event, your performance, uh, and they're going to feel more engaged with you. One of the ways that you can you can humanize your brand um, is really using a lot of social media, um, Facebook pages. Uh, you know, using Facebook for example, uh, you can do this, and it shouldn't be necessarily you know 100% sales pitches. Um, you can instead leverage media. You can leverage hashtags and video. Uh, really using uh, a lot of uh, rich media, uh, giving people an insight as to what's going on. You can also uh, post up maybe a, an interview with a guest artist or uh, a speaker that you have, maybe something from your rehearsal or from backstage. This really engages people and makes your brand feel more uh, more human because you're you're giving them an, an, an inside feel to what's going on with your organization. Another another thing shaping the trend today is uh, really establishing a voice. Um, you really want to clearly define your brand and messaging, and the most important thing is to socialize this internally among your staff. Consider your patrons, and your you want to really consider your patrons and target patrons, and you want to develop personas so that you can plan your efforts to align with these. Uh, socialize them. You tell everyone on your staff what your different personas are, and you make sure that your staff is really on board with how to speak to different groups of people uh, in different ways. You, you know, an organization can can easily have more different voices depending on your patron groups and the different types of people that attend your performances. It might be segmented by different types of evenings that you have, or different types of performances, maybe the subject matter of your performance or event. But you really want to establish these different voices uh, that can easily field questions um, based on these different um, uh, personas, uh, and make sure that they're um, you know that they're really engaged because you can engage them at a deep level, and all of your staff can engage people at a different level if they know who's coming to see the performances. So another poll here. Uh, do do any of you use buyer personas to guide your marketing efforts? Let me launch the poll here and give you a few seconds to answer. Okay, a couple more. 
a second here. Okay, so it looks like 71 of the percent of the attendees here don't actually use buyer personas, and this is something that we're you know that we feel is very important these days. And um, even as a product manager for uh, for developing the software um, or developing anything uh, today, uh, we always use buyer personas, uh, and we use personas to, and we have you know fictitious characters about who's going to be using. Um, who would be using software and who would be uh, engaging with the company. And this is really important for our development team to actually um, be able to develop products because they can relate more to, oh, I understand what this person is or who this person is. Um, and you can even go in as far um, as, you know, you give them a name, um, you, can, uh, you can define their voice, their, po their personality, their tone, the content, um, and you really describe who that person is. You give them demographics, maybe what part of this, uh, what part of the city or area that they live in. Um, you know, you know, maybe their age range or age group. Um, so it's you know really important to know who your target audience is and and help your staff to be able to talk to them. It also helps when you're engaging with your volunteers. Um, of your organization to be able to bring these um, personas and train your different uh, your different uh, volunteers on these different personas as well. So another thing that's shaping the marketing landscape today is you really want to make your conversations meaningful. Uh, and what I mean by that is you want don't want to just necessarily broadcast. Uh, people uh, are talking to people. Just speaking to them no longer works. People want to. People talk amongst themselves, um, and they talk amongst themselves long before they come into your doors. So you want to be talk, talking with your patrons. You want to know what your patrons are saying. Um, you want to listen to them, and be thoughtful, and consider their point of view. Uh, encourage and value their feedback. And you might even want to incorporate feedback into your own marketing and business plan um, if it makes sense. This all goes into uh, really humanizing your brand by <clears throat> uh, making quality engagements uh, with your audience. So it's really about having those meaningful conversations in the lobby. Uh, maybe you have a, a small uh, a small panel of people um, that uh, um, that you engage with or pre-show talk before your before your event. Um, you can also uh, do this online via social media and surveys. There's many, many different ways that you can engage your uh, audience with meaningful conversations. Another important trend these days is making sure that you're customer centric. You want to make sure that your content um, is, is very relevant um, uh, and compelling and really digestible. This is, I think, one part um, for a mobile landscape that's extremely important is the digestible content. A lot of uh, websites I see or I visit today, it's, it's confusing or it doesn't get exactly to the point that you know, what is it that you're trying to sell? What's your call to action? What is it really that people want to do when they come to your website? Um, one of the things that we talk about here at Vendini is one of the, uh, what is, when people come to you know, websites for performing arts, what are they looking for? And the main thing that they're looking for is probably either to buy tickets or get directions to your venue or maybe a phone to call you. So those are really the top things that they're looking for uh, on your website. So you want to make sure that those things are, are present and that uh, you know, they're, they stand out and that they're easily accessible. Uh, another important thing is to make sure that you're cohesive, that you have a very cohesive experience online and offline. Uh, and what I mean by this is your print ads and your, uh, any of your ads that are uh, around the city or around your town uh, in the newspapers, also the, uh, on the radio, uh, which goes back to you know, having a voice for your company. You want to make sure that this is very consistent from, uh, around, from your online experience, so your website, your social media. They should all carry your same branding. Uh, they should all carry your same uh, look and feel for your organization so that you really drive home that experience 
and when people see something of yours that's an advertisement, maybe in, on, a, in a, on a bus stop, maybe at, you know, at the mall if you're advertising there, online somewhere, um, an advertisement uh, online, they'll understand and they'll know that it's you and it's your organization and they're more likely, the more you repeat that, they're more likely to engage with you and buy. And finally, you want to be able to listen, engage, and iterate. So you want to listen to what your, your audience is saying. Um, you want to really engage them in multiple different ways, online, socially, in person, uh, also at your venue. And you want to take that information, their feedback that they're telling you, and then use that to make changes and start the process all over again for your next season. So the next topic that I'd like to talk about is really how to nail the patron experience. And really your goal is you want the like of patron. And when we're talking about this in relationship to the mobile landscape, this really means that you, you need to have a responsive design for your website. Um, and not only your website, but also your communications, your emails. Um, your surveys, your landing pages, anything that you present to your, your uh, patrons needs to really have a responsive design. And so just a question for everybody out there. Let me launch this poll here as well. How many of you have actually tried to purchase tickets on your own website using a mobile phone? So I think this is really interesting that um, it looks like the two-thirds of the people attending today have never even tried to purchase tickets on your own website with a mobile phone. This is, this is something that is uh, really important these days, um, especially seeing that most of the people today um, are, try are visiting, uh, get receiving emails and or probably visiting your, your site from their mobile device, they may be on their way to your organization or their, to your an event. Uh, so they have their mobile phone up and they're really they're trying to find directions or information. Um, and you know, or they, they may be looking for something to do that evening. They may be out on the town and they want to buy a ticket. And so it should be, you should really have that in consideration that that your patrons are engaging you on their mobile device, and so it should be very easy, and you should know what your mobile experience is for all of your audience members or for all of your patrons. And so this brings to the point that content is really king. king. Uh, you want your content, you need content to engage your customers at pre-sale. Uh, you want really engaging content, something that's digestible again, uh, something that will compel them to go forward and buy and buy your your event or a ticket to your um, performance and by delivering the um, uh, don't over promise build trust with your your patrons and if you have a, a very good online offline experience and that includes when people arrive at your venue uh, your offline experience that when they walk in they should still see your same branding they should still see that it's you that's uh, engaging them at the at the venue um, and you want to use, um, uh, that'll help build trust that, you know, they're seeing the same information time and time again. Uh, you also can use cu uh, customer quotes um, and information from, uh, from media. You want to put quotes out there um, and what people are saying about your event. This will also help build trust with them. Uh, and you can establish expertise. If you have good content, and your information is readily available on your website about your event, um, people will feel like they're empowered to be an expert about your brand or your event, which is always a good thing um, that if they're asking you, uh, that they're asking you to, um, um, to have uh, for uh, information, then if somebody else engages them or talks about your, your event, 
then they will um, be uh, going forward. They can a actually answer them and have conversations with other people. And the other thing to, uh, for your content is to make sure that you're using rich content. Video, images, podcasts. These are all great ways uh, to really make sure that people know who you are and what you are. Uh, and, you know, images can really say a lot, especially videos. Um, they can they can give information to a lot of information to people uh, in a in a short amount of time, uh, and then they can feel like that what they're going to see on stage or at your event is they've already got a glimpse at it. Or they've already had a preview. And you want to bring your brand and events to life. You want to make them more meaningful by having these extra experiences and participatory experiences. This is something that uh, extra content that you can bring and extra value that can, you can bring to your organization. So the main comp point here is you really want to deliver value. Um, so you know we don't want to we don't want to mislead um, our patrons in any way, um, and you really want to. Uh, you know, you want to keep engaging and easily digestible um, uh, content, and you want to make it on the patrons' terms. Really, what are what are your patrons' needs and concerns, and how can you tailor your content uh, and offer to align with those? Um, and and one way to do that is to refer back to your patron personas. That I really encourage everyone um, to to uh, develop. So another way that we can encourage and, and really get our patrons on board is by retargeting. And what we mean by retargeting is uh, bringing web visitors back and converting them to sales. Uh, and it, by doing this, by retargeting, uh, these are these types of ads um, that you that you can see all around. Uh, you might have gone to uh, you, if you surfed or searched Google something maybe about a ballet uh, or a specific ballet. And then the next time you go to another website, all of a sudden you're seeing advertisements around the edge for that ballet company or, or any type of ballet company. Uh, this is called retargeting. And there's a lot of uh, mobile marketing uh, or marketing um, agencies out there that specialize in helping you retarget. You give them your demographics and your keywords and they will help you retarget uh, online. And this is very powerful. Um, specifically, uh, there's, a, there's a study that says that 95% percent of, percent of visitors who browse a retailer site uh, do not complete a transaction on their visit. Um, but retargeted customers are nearly 70% more likely to complete a purchase as compared to the non-retargeted customer. So this just means that the consumers are they might come to your website the first time. They're probably not going to buy. They're probably going to go out, look for reviews, ask their friends, check your social media. And in all of those places, you have the opportunity to retarget them and to bring brand awareness and increase your brand awareness by, by offering these additional advertisements to them. Uh, and then once you've engaged them again, they'll see these advertisements two or three times they're more likely to come back, and then they'll actually complete the purchase on their retargeted visit. So, what is um, you know one of the things that we've been talking about this whole time is the, the user experience, and really you want to optimize and make sure that you have an optimized user experience. Uh, user experience um, is really the combination of you know how much pleasure someone gets out of engaging with you, how useful the information is that you're presenting to them, and how functional is that information. Uh, and one, uh, one of the ways that you can create this user experience is having a responsive design. Um, and with that responsive design, it's going to create a great user experience. And you need to keep in mind that, uh, that with the responsive design, you're going to get something that's viewable on any type of, whether it's your website, your mobile application, or your email, it's available on all different types of sizes of screens, from large desktops with giant screens 
you know, they might be viewing it on their TV, or they could be viewing it on their tablet, their mobile phone. Whatever size that they, that they view your content on, you really want to make sure that they can easily interact and really engage with your company in an easy and cohesive way. So here's another question, another poll for everyone. Is your website mobile optimized or is responsively designed? Okay, so it looks like a little over half, or about half of you, um, actually have already mobile, uh, optimized your website for mobile design, and that's really great. Those are really great statistics to know that at least you know that there are organizations that are starting to look at this and and starting to understand that this is really important in today's uh, market space. So, what is a mobile friendly? Um, mobile friendly is making sure that you again have a responsive design something that can be viewed on any type of display. Um, your content should be mobile friendly. Um, this means that you, you don't want to have your patrons scrolling too much, uh, so you want to keep your copy short. Uh, make sure that your images scale down to size, that they're, you know, that they're something that's meaningful to them, and that your call to actions are very clear, clearly defined. Uh, you also want to engage um, mobile friendly. You can uh, engage in mobile advertising. Uh, again, there's marketing agencies out there that can help you with in, um, actually engaging in mobile advertising. Um, SMS opportunities, um, as we mentioned at the very beginning, uh, people are eight times more likely to use an SMS coupon than they are any other type of coupon. So having an SMS opt-in, um, this is something that you can do. You can, uh, just like a regular mailing list, uh, you can have this advertised at your venue uh, or your event that you know, text a certain phrase to a number and sign up for um, SMS updates. You can also use that because people are coming up to the box office. Um, you can have them, uh, you can send them an SMS update or a coupon maybe for a drink uh, or uh, you can even run some, some of them will allow you to run a small contest. Um, I was recently at a concert where they ran a contest. If you opt into their uh, mailing list, they were going to select one person for a free upgraded seat. So it's just a way to encourage people to opt in and, and to really engage with you on a mobile um, presence. Another way to be mobile friendly is actually have a mobile application. So if it, if it fits your organization, uh, you might want to design uh, a specific app that people can download to interact with your or engage with your, your audience. And of course, you definitely want to have, make sure that you have mobile sales and mobile ticketing. Uh, so that's uh, the, the buying experience should be uh, mobile friendly and also uh, you know, it's very nice. People like to have their tickets on their mobile phone. If you're using an iPhone in your passbook or uh, if you have some type of scannable ticket from your phone. So you want to engage your customers uh, uh, because they are connected 24-7. They're likely they're, they're going to be ha they'll have their device when they come or visit your uh, venue and also when they leave your venue. Um, you can also uh, target your uh, audience depending on where they are in your venue. Uh, and so this is really the the key is here by using location based data. Uh, the location based data can help you detect the proximity of where your patron is. You can, uh, one of the technologies that is out there today that's um, starting to become popular in, in a few larger venues is something called iBeacon by it's an Apple product where it can target your presence within a couple hundred feet of where you are. Uh, this is, you know, can be useful in a lot of different ways. Uh, you know, for instance, if there's, you know, you can sense that someone's near a bathroom, you can offer them additional, you know, restrooms that are upstairs or maybe in a different part of your venue. Um, if you're a museum, uh, you can have them use, you could use this type of uh, technology 
to automatically display information about uh, the, the the topic or the, the item that they're they're viewing or the piece of artwork that they're viewing right there on their mobile device without having to have them read uh, a sign or, or check out some kind of device from your organization. Uh, so this allows you to bring really timely and highly targeted updates to your uh, to your audience. Um, some other things that are locate, lo location based is um, wearables are becoming a lot more um, uh, a lot more prevalent in today's mobile landscape. Um, you know, there's a lot of fitness devices out there today. These are all wearables. Um, Google's launched the Google Glasses. Um, so these are all different. You know, there's these are coming into the mobile marketing space. And so you want to try to think of ways that you can leverage this to to get people um, to deliver more information. Um, and it's just giving to the whole wealth of data that's out there about where your patrons are and what they're doing and where they're spending time with you and your venue. So the, the, next, the last, one of the next parts we want to talk about is really harnessing the power of social media. Um, there's so many ways to engage your audience uh, in social media. Um, and I want to ask a question here. What social media channels does your organization use? And you can select multiple answers. So this is pretty interesting that um, everybody uses Facebook. That's not really a surprise these days. Um, and Twitter is uh, very popular here, and YouTube. So I would say that these are, are definitely um, are definitely the usually the top three um, things that we that we understand uh, or that we see. Um, and I see not as much interest in uh, Instagram or Pinterest. Um, these are also interesting uh, interesting tools. Um, uh, and ways to engage your audience. Um, but it really goes back to uh, you need to, when you define your personas, um, you also want to think about your personas and which one of the social uh, media aspects that that persona is going to uh, interact with. So if you're looking at a persona maybe for the millennials, they're, they might be looking at Facebook, but they're more likely going to be engaging on Instagram. Um, or and or Twitter, so uh, this is something that's a lot more popular in, in that in that demographic. So you really want to target and, and think about the social media channels that you're using, and really how to leverage those um, leverage those social media um, uh, for for that actual persona uh, that may be a specific performance, um, or when you're trying to engage new audiences. Another important part about social media is um, how social media can impact uh, your SEO. Um, just a quick show of hands, uh, how many people, you can raise your hand on your screen, how many people know what SEO is? Okay. So we have a few people that know what SEO is. So, SEO, is, what SEO is, is um, it's search engine optimization. So this is how Google ranks you. Uh, this is looking at um, when someone does a search for you on Google or Yahoo, Bing, any of these search engines, uh, they have very complex algorithms um, that uh, when people search for keywords or, or key terms that determine what they display back for the results. And really, if you want to be on the top of that list, you need to make sure that you have uh, optimized your website, your presence online uh, to give you the best possible ranking for these search engines. Um, there are, um, there are a, a great number of organizations out there that specialize just in doing SEO for you um, that will help you streamline your, um, your website 
make sure that you have the proper data on your website. Sometimes it's invisible data um, that you don't actually see when you visit a website. Uh, but there's a lot of information there that the search engines can use. And one way that you can impact your ranking is by using social media. Uh, the more ways that you have from large um, trusted websites such as Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, the more links from these types of uh, uh, websites or organizations back to your website and organization will give you a much stronger presence and a much higher ranking. Um, so you want to make sure that you use a diverse array of social media channels, um, but you also need to make sure that you're pinpointing that audience-specific social channel um, back to, the, to your personas and who you really want to engage. Um, and another way that you can uh, leverage social media and SEO is also by using crowdsourcing. And so a lot of you may know crowdsourcing um, by, uh, or think of it as funding, but it's not necessarily just funding. Um, it, it's any type of, any time you get information from, uh, from uh, a group of people. So I want to talk a little bit more just about crowdsourcing. So here's a little bit, uh, so crowdsourcing, um, uh, so this is really important uh, these days uh, in the new, in the next generation of your audience, the millennials. Um, and it's a way to help, another way to help encourage them to participate uh, and get involved. Um, there's, you know, traditional crowdsourcing such as Kickstarter and Indiegogo, which is more related to funding, which can also be a great thing um, if you have an upcoming event or something that you want to uh, raise funds for, then uh, this is a way that you can get some initial funding uh, and have people actually stakeholders in your event or your upcoming performance. Uh, but also crowdsourcing can be simple as um, uh, asking a poll on Facebook, um, having people um, give opinions by tweeting or, or to a hashtag um, but, and offering opinions and ideas. Uh, you might ask people to um, which composer they would like to listen to um, in your upcoming season, or which choreographer they would like to see for a dance event, or there's many different types of ways you can ask questions and engage your audience and give them and give these um, get them engaged, and they'll feel more part of your organization when they see that that actually comes to fruition in your next season. They can say, "Oh, I helped make that decision." So after all of this, what do we want to put, how do we put this all together? Well, we really want to think about the big picture now. Um, we've talked a lot of today about um, how to engage your audience in the mobile and the online, but really you're in the big picture, you have to really keep in mind that you need a holistic approach to your marketing mix. You can't just have one or the other. Uh, and mobile is, and online is very important these days, and so you need to bring that into the fold like you would, and, and have it as prevalent as your, um, your radio, your in-person, um, and your traditional media that you have out there today. Um, it's very important to make sure it's seamless and consistent across all your channels, and you really want to make sure that it's cohesive from the time they first engage you on your website or maybe an email campaign, an SMS uh, opt-in, or, uh, or, or some type of advertisement they see on a billboard um, all the way through the time that they arrive at your venue and when they walk, first walk in the door. They, you w must engage them and make them feel that it's the same consistent experience across the, the whole time. Um, and you want to make sure that you, ex um, you extend your online and offline um, marketing in both directions. In your offline ads, you want to point back to uh, landing pages and your Facebook, Twitter pages. Um, also, uh, you know, in your um, Twitter and Facebook, you might point to um, in-person things that can happen or participatory experiences that they can do or participate in um, when they're at the, at the venue. So it's really just about um, uh, keeping everything and not short-sighting any one part of your uh, marketing mix.
So the next thing uh, you want to do um, once you've got your marketing mix together, and this is really important, um, is to think about even before you launch any type of marketing effort is how are you going to measure it? How are you going to uh, track your statistics? Um, there are a lot of things, a lot of ways out there um, to, to track your online engagement. Um, Facebook has some really good um, statistics and um, uh, in, information about who's, who you're engaging and how well your, your different stories and articles are, are trending. Uh, you can also use Google Analytics. Um, those types of things to, to figure out how you're going to measure it. Uh, you can also do A-B testing, um, which, you know, putting out the different versions of an ad uh, to different markets or different targets uh, to see which one uh, is responded to more. Um, and you can do this online, and you can also do it offline, um, you know, by having QR codes on your uh, on your print ads. You can also um, have special landing pages that people are going to engage with your company with when they come back. But it's really important for you to know where these, um, how well, how to measure your marketing efforts and you want to actually measure it. So here's an, our last poll for the day. So uh, do you have metrics in place to measure your marketing, goal, uh, marketing efforts against your goals? Okay, so uh, it looks like the majority don't measure your goals at all. Um, uh, the next one uh, is, is actually good that the next group of people measure both online and offline. So it's really important to, to measure your goals in some way or another. And, uh, and you know, like I said, there are organizations out there, there are even marketing companies out there um, that can uh, help you measure your goals and actually give you information about that. So you can, you can search those out. I know um, one that we often see at uh, organizations uh, or uh, conferences with us, um, if you're an arts organization, it's called Mogo Arts. <clears throat> They're very good about um, giving you information and taking information for you um, and helping you track your online conversion rates. So at the minimum, you should be at least tracking your online efforts. So after you get your, after you figure out how to measure your information, and you measure your information, you can take that feedback, uh, you can turn it around, uh, use it to refine your process, refine your marketing goals, refine your strategy, um, and that's what uh, you can use to uh, implement for next season or your next event. Um, and this puts you back in your cycle that you want to gather your information, listen to people then you want to measure and see how effective it was in engaging your audience, um, make small changes, and you know, refine it until you get the, really the mix and the, the, the right marketing mix that works for your group or your organization. So now I'd like to uh, turn it over for Melissa to field some questions that have been coming in throughout the, throughout the webinar. Um, so it looks like we've got a bunch of questions here from the audience. Let's start with a couple questions about um, taking it back to buyer personas. Okay. So Carlin, Carlin and Julia had a question. They were asking, you know, can you explain in a little bit more detail what a buyer persona is exactly? Like maybe you could walk us through um, like what an example would look like, what, what sort of different things you would consider, and how someone, an organization would begin to um, build out and research buyer personas. Sure, sure. So um, buyer personas, the, the way that you would start out is, um, you know, you want to look at, uh, first of all, I usually take demographics. Um, I, I start to look at who, what's your, the typical group um, for your buy, for, for your, for this group. And, and when I did this at the ballet, um, uh, we first looked at who are our subscribers. So this is, you know, one easy target group. Um, you can look at the, their, what are their, what's their average age, what's their average income, um, 
what's a typical job that they might have. Um, and you can actually start to put them down and you can make an actual person. You can you know, name them. And, and this is kind of the, some of the fun parts of it. You, know, you can give them a name, like you know, uh, the Sally the season ticket holder. Um, and you can, you know, she might be 54 years old. Um, she's you know, got a husband. So you, you go through the whole, the whole um, uh, scenario of what, this, what might make up this person's life. Um, what types of things engage them. Uh, does she like to go to the other part, other theater events, or is she dedicated to um, just the type of uh, event that you're in? Um, so you really want to start to think about who that type of person is and what would make them, what would compel them to buy uh, an, a ticket to your event. Um, other important things to consider are, um, you know, what makes that person tick and what what makes that person what in, um, what kind of problems may come up with that person, and how should your staff engage with them and settle those types of um, uh, problems? So you know you might have different ways of settling a problem for, for instance, your season ticket holders versus a discount ticket buyer. These are just different personas that you would want to have. So just off the top of my head, you would probably want to have one for your season ticket holders. You might even have one for your board members um, or a major donor. Uh, you might have a buyer persona for single ticket buyers. Um, you could have a buyer persona specifically for your uh, uh, your younger single single ticket buyers, a younger audience that you're trying to cultivate. Um, I know one that we had um, it, because we engaged, uh, we were engaging a lot at the time uh, with Groupon and a lot of discount uh, discount uh, ticketing. Um, we had a, a persona for um, a discount ticket buyer, which is quite different than a, a traditional ticket or a single ticket purchase or full price. So these are all the different types of personas you would want to go through and just think about um, from your experiences even. Um, you, uh, a wealth of information you can get from your box office or the people selling your tickets uh, or the people managing your events. Um, uh, you, can, you can easily figure out who these different people are and write a small story about them, who they are, um, that's, and, and really what compromises them in their life. That's great information, John. And I think um, just to reference, you know, how we, what we do at Vendini, we've also basically just laid out like one pager um, for, you know, our different buyer personas that we engage with to, so people can always reference them internally. So, you know, um, maybe it has their photo, where they live, information about their income, where they go to get information, so what social media channels they hang out on. Maybe this is um, an older demographic and they're not as social and not as focused towards online efforts, so they read more traditional media like the newspaper, um, stuff like that. So that's also helpful to have those, um, those personas laid out where the entire company can access them so that information is easily shared and accessible. Um, let's see. So let's take another question. Um, Chloe was asking, and I, I think you may have gotten to this, but I'll, let, let's cover it again just in case. Chloe was asking if you can just define what responsive design is exactly. I know we talk about mobile optimization and responsive design. What, is, what does that exactly mean? Yeah, so responsive design is um, the ability for a website, an email, or really anything that, you're, that you present online to be viewed on any device um, and, and that it delivers the same content and it's rendered properly on any device. So if you look at uh, um, your website on your phone, on your tablet, on your desktop, on your desktop with a 46-inch monitor, that any, any type of screen that you view a website email with, that it's going to be displayed correctly you don't have to necessarily scroll too much to the left or to the right, um, or that you don't have to scroll, you know, that the content is delivered to you as it was really intended. Um, at Vendini, we go so far to say is um, when we are designing websites for um, our, our clients can also have us host their website in something called Sightline, uh, we go so far, so far as to say that we do the design as mobile first. So we actually design the, the, the content or a mobile phone or an iPad, uh, and then we scale it up to a desktop level. And if you would like some examples, um, 
Uh, one example of one that we that uh, we have is uh, Soho Playhouse. Um, that's a great example of a, a, a website that is um, responsive. Um, and just a regular consumer brand, one that actually um, uh, was quite impressive to me recently that I saw was Virgin America. They have a great mobile, they have a great responsive site, and it's a really uh, engaging uh, website now. Okay, so it looks like um, we have a couple more questions about personas. Okay. Um, Chris, Christine's asking, you know, as you're thinking about your personas, um, is there is there a tool or an instrument that you would recommend to help um, arts organizations pull their theater patrons to determine, you know, what personas they should have? Um, so a lot of, well, if you haven't already done it, a lot of times your personas can base, be based on um, segmentation that you already have from your marketing group. So a lot of times the marketing group already has segments, um, or even your development group will have um, development organization will have segments that they that they market to specifically, um, and so that's always a good starting point is how you segment your audience already. Um, if you haven't segmented your audience at all, um, then uh, basically you want to start uh, gathering as much information about your audience as you can. Um, you can do that through polls and surveys um, by getting general demographics from them. Um, you, you don't want to just ask demographic questions, but if you do, did put out a survey or a poll um, uh, within your, uh, at one of your events, you can gather their age, um, you know, where they live, uh, and ask those specific targeted questions, um, you know, their gender, um, to find out you know, who, your, who your audience really is. Um, so there's there's ways to get the information in those ways. But as far as like specific tools, there's not really any tools out there today that will give you all of that information. I think if someone is like, if you um, maybe want to start with sending, like you could build a survey, you might use something like SurveyMonkey to do that and send it online. But you can also just chat with folks in your lobby at events and kind of, right. um, you know, do a survey that way, sort of like an in-person um, marketing research group, but not as official. And and that's that goes back to something I said earlier is you know the, uh, people that are engaging your your audience at the venue um, or at the event, um, and uh, you know a lot of times it's your box office um, or your will call, um, your volunteers, um, any are you know, those types of people that are in your organization. They're always gonna uh, they're gonna have a wealth of information for you about you know, who de what what your demographics look like. Yeah, that's a great point. They're really like the eyes and ears out in the field. That's right. Um. So one other question here, and um, we'll probably wrap up like maybe with one or two more questions. We want to respect everyone's time. So okay. Um. The next question is from Brenda, and she was referencing back to the portion of the presentation where we were talking about mobile and SMS. So Brenda was asking, how um, how does she find out more information about SMS marketing efforts? Is there um, like a service or something that you might recommend to start with? Um, there's a there's an abundance of services out there today, um, and I, you know the the I don't have any personal favorites to use. Um, I don't even know. I know that we used one at the ballet company that I was at, but I, I don't even know which one it was. Our marketing department was responsible for that, um, and I actually wasn't in the marketing department at that time. Um, but you know, you, there's there's a lot out there. Um, you can you can search on Google for SMS marketing, um, and you know, there's a lot of them that will pop up. They all you know have different um, you know different services that are cloud. They're all cloud based basically. Um, and there's different service levels that offer you different things. Um, and a great example of of um, a type of campaign that was used was, you know, like Red Cross um, used one for disaster relief, where you can um, you can text a certain phrase to a number, and it'll automatically, you know, donate five dollars to a campaign. So there's there's ways that you can use SMS like that. And so if you're wanting to use it for donations, then you would target the the type of um, SMS um, Groups that do um, that do for donations versus some that are more for uh, coupons and and updating. 
Yeah, that's a great point. I know um, aside from like SMS donate campaigns, there's we also have a member, um, that I think they're in Southern California, and they actually used SMS mobile updates. Um, what they did was they had like a QR code that they had at their box office and people could scan it or sign up for SMS updates online by entering in their mobile, mobile phone. And basically the organization incentivized people to sign up for SMS updates about when new tickets go on sale, special offers by saying you'll get exclusive sort of um, early access to new events in your interest area as they go on sale. So we'll send you a text when we first release tickets and you, you know, you maybe you'll get a discounted offer or you'll get access to purchase tickets before the general public. So that's sort of an interesting thing that you could play around with too, in addition to donations. Um, and let's take one more question here. Um, Zacharin and Julia are both asking, you know, we talked a lot today about mobile and online and social. Um, how does how does that impact, you know, more traditional marketing, um, like newspaper ads and printed materials? Are those still relevant today? What's, um, what's your, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I definitely, you have to know your audience. So, um, you know, and I, I would say if you're an arts organization, you probably know the statistics from your, um, you can find the statistics from, you know, just general arts um, research that say, you know, the audience members are still, um, you know, probably in the, depending on what type of art or organization, but they're probably a little bit older, um, uh, probably a little more affluent, this type of thing. So this, these, those types of individuals, and it goes back to personas again, those individuals are probably more likely to still be using traditional media, such as newspapers and print ads. So you can't, you definitely can't ignore them. Uh, but you might, uh, you might opt to maybe find out, and this goes back to being able to measure your metrics, um, if you can somehow find out uh, by offering them special offers, if they go to a landing page that they see from a newspaper ad, to really measure your efforts against those um, traditional media so that you know which ones are working and which ones aren't working. Also, you should monitor your sales. Um, based on when you run your print ads. If you're doing radio or print, um, you might not be able to immediately find out what your, um, if they, you know, bought because of that. But if you see, you know, you ran a, a, an ad in a local newspaper and all of a sudden, you know, the next day your box office sales, you know, double, then obviously that print ad had an effect on your, your, your actual revenue. So you want to stagger your media and when it's introduced, and you want to make sure you have a timeline and a cadence of when you when you introduce that, so that you can measure that against your box office sales, and so you can see which things are being uh, uh, having more impact. And if it's having a, if you have an online ad that goes online, um, and it has more impact, you might want to beef up and have that more and spend more money on that than you would on traditional. But it's definitely um, you have to have a, a, a full mix, especially in the arts. It has to be a full mix of all the media. Great. And then one last question for you here, John, um, and then we can wrap up. Frank is asking, um, how does, this is, I guess, specific to Vendini, how does Vendini actually help integrate things that we've talked about today, like social media, um, maybe direct mailing lists or email marketing lists, and, you know, measuring those efforts? Frank is yeah. saying that his organization uses a ton of separate programs that are, you know, a bunch of different systems to track all of those different metrics. Um, right. How is that integrated into the Vendini? Yeah, so actually that's a, a, good, a, a good point. Um, and it kind of goes back to the very first slide that I, one of the very first slides I presented. Um, we actually have one uh, dashboard that you log into. Um, and from that dashboard, you can access all of the things about your events, um, if you're one of our Sightline members, um, you can also configure your website from right, right inside the dashboard. We have email marketing uh, that's part of the dashboard as well. All your patron management is there. Um, and uh, we also, so diving down into a little bit more, uh, inside when you're creating events, you can also post those events um, on your Facebook and you can um, integrate them right into Facebook and uh, other social medias. Um, channels right from your event uh, and when people 
click through and purchase via these email campaigns you send out, um, via Facebook, any of these type, different types of um, uh, engagement, as they start to funnel back in, we can track that right back to a dollar amount. So we can tell you exactly how much money uh, an email marketing campaign actually um, gave you in uh, ticket sales. And so um, we track all of that, and especially when you're looking at uh, site line and the website, um, if you have your website up, when you post an event, um, it, when you just create an event and you say that it's on sale, it automatically populates on your website. You don't have to go and update your website. We do it for you uh, in the back end. Um, so it's just an automatic thing. Uh, and we also track all of the analytics that come back from, uh, from both ways. Uh, from uh, from the, the website as well for traditional web sales, so it's pretty encompassing um, that we uh, we we fold all of these things into one easy place that you can log in and manage it from one place. Wonderful. And then I think the the last question that we got from a couple attendees was, um, will you know can we access this presentation after today? Will you be sharing slides or a recording? And the answer to that is we definitely we will be. We recorded the session today, so um, keep an eye out for an email in probably the next week or so, and we will link you to a recording so you can rewatch it if you'd like, share it with your coworkers, um, whatever. Yeah, and, and just another thing is, you know, I, the last slide up here is to, to keep in touch. So if any of you have any questions, um, uh, we will, I think if there were any other, there might be, have been some other questions that came in that we didn't get time to answer. Um, we'll try to get back to you uh, with a personal answer um, uh, to any of your questions. Uh, and if you think of anything else or would you would like more specific information from me about anything that I covered today, my uh, contact email is up on the screen. Uh, so feel free to reach out at any time. Thank you so much for joining us today, everyone. Bye-bye.